Good morning. Good morning. We Good are morning. up here on the platform ready to sing at this time. Are you ready to sing? Are you ready to give joy to the Lord in song? Oh boy. Why don't we stand? Huh? Here <laughs> that you go. would be a good place to start. Let's stand. We're standing on the promises of God. Sing it out this morning. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong core, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my
God's grace Amen. this morning. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's a joy to be with you this morning, and we welcome you to the worship service uh, during the week when I was learning from uh, numerous individuals who would be traveling, who would be camping, who would be here, who would be there, who would be hither, thither, and yon. I told the folks yesterday, the guys yesterday at uh, Workday, I said, well, Jesus started with 12 disciples and himself, so hopefully we'll have at least 13 here. So I look out, I think we have more than 13, so we're, we're off to a good start. It's, it's good, though, to be in the house of the Lord, and we trust the Lord that um, his presence will lead and guide and direct in our hearts and in our lives today, and for that we are grateful. I've mentioned from time to time that as a, as a pastor, I have, I have come to appreciate more and more over the years the place of young, innocent, and impressionable lives that God brings to uh, our midst, that God brings into the church, that God gives us the privilege to love and to nurture and to share with parents and minister to these precious lives. And I, I believe with all of my heart, if we invest in any group with intensity and with interest, it's children. For if we get a hold of their hearts early, if we nurture them in the faith early while they're young, the odds are far greater for that child then when the age of accountability is reached and they know what they should do, they will have a greater likelihood of choosing Jesus because of parents and because of a church that have loved them, prayed for them, and nurtured them in the faith. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. So this morning, there, there's just a privilege that we have, and we are all to participate in that and are given the opportunity to do so. We have the opportunity today to uh, baptize, and we'll talk about that in just a moment as we look at the uh, litany and as, the, as we look at the liturgy of that, we have the opportunity today to uh, baptize a life that I know uh, matters greatly, first of all, to God, but also to uh, especially Pastor Mike and Kitty, as well as Sean and Stephanie and others. But we are so thankful today that we have the opportunity to baptize little Carter James Katora. So if the family members will bring him to the front, right here in front of the communion table, we will participate and join in this privilege of baptizing him. So Kitty and Mike, leave the platform and join us down front. <laughs> Well, it's a privilege to welcome the family. 
of this little guy. It's remarkable what lives like Carter's do to unite and draw families together. You would agree, wouldn't you, Carter? As Wesleyans, as individuals who understand life from a Wesleyan perspective, we recognize the operation of prevenient grace. We recognize that God is at work at a very young age in getting a hold of our hearts, putting us in places where uh, we are protected, where we are taught about Jesus, where we're instructed in the matters of the faith, so that we have an inclination, not against God and running from God, but running to Him. How important that is in the precious life, heart, and mind of a little one. So we believe that until the age of accountability, God through Christ covers us, that the atonement indeed covers us and protects us. And that is what we believe about provenient grace. Therefore, it's appropriate, as we know in Acts, that whole households were baptized, not only adults, but also children. So we believe that this is well within a biblical perspective, that we not only dedicate Carter, but that we baptize him. So hear these words as we look at the importance of this covenant. We believe that Christ gave this holy sacrament as a sign and a seal of his new covenant. Christian baptism signifies for this young child God's gracious acceptance on the basis of his prevenient grace in Christ and points forward to his personal appropriation of the benefits of the atonement when he reaches the age of accountability and exercises conscious saving faith in Jesus Christ. And that is our objective. In presenting this child for baptism, you are hereby witnessing to your own personal Christian faith and to your purpose to guide him early in life to a knowledge of Christ as Savior. To this end, it is your duty to teach him, remember that, as soon as he shall be able to learn the nature and end of this holy sacrament, to watch over his education, that he may not be led astray, to direct his feet to the sanctuary, to restrain him from evil associates and habits, and as much as in you lies, to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So that this congregation, and as we make covenant before God, may know your intent, hear this question. Will you endeavor to do so by the help of God? If so, answer, I will. I will. What we do here is... I will, I will dip my hand in this font and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit three times, I will place water on Carter's head. I will not pour it on Carter's head. <laughs> he, that was a preemptive strike. Yes. So that's what we will do at this point. And as a minister of the gospel... Perhaps there's no greater joy than through this simple means exercising our objective to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Carter James Katora, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, life is surely your gift to us. We thank you for the precious nature of little ones. They are to us an heritage of the Lord. We thank you for giving Sean and Stephanie a precious little son. Thank you for the binding joy that he brings to two different families. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that is shared because of his precious life. With this gift comes great responsibility. We ask that as you have blessed 
Sean and Stephanie and their marriage with this wonderful, innocent life. We pray that they would understand with pleasure, but also with soberness, what it is that is required of them to bring him up in the ways of Jesus. We pray that soon, as soon as he is able to understand, in his earliest expression of faith, he will trust Jesus for his own salvation. We pray to that end, we work to that end, and we ask your blessing upon this family and your grace in sufficiency to be on Carter. We ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Here's a certificate as well as a little testament to indicate what we have done here today. You're welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure. My pleasure. Remember these vows of today. Blessings. Good to see you. God bless you. We need to find Carter a little better example, but uh, <laughs> that was terrible. I'm sorry, Pastor Mike. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Pastor Aaron, I think, is going to lead us in uh, some of the announcements, some of the highlights, and then we will also have a uh, brief video clip and I think also an announcement regarding our ongoing ministry through Operation Christmas Child. So p pay close attention as we look at what is happening in the life of faith. Good morning. Don't feel bad, Pastor Jonathan, for making a comment about Pastor Mike. I had one of my own I was going to make. <clears throat> it was something about passing down his genes to uh, generations to come, but I won't make that comment. But uh, I always love uh, baby dedications. It's such a privilege that we are able to do in the life of the church. But good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. If you agree, say amen. All right. Even though it is obvious, there are a few who are other pla uh, in other places this morning than the house of the Lord, but that's okay. But uh, we have a few announcements to uh, talk about this morning before uh, we go to the Lord in prayer and return to worship. And pretty much everything is in your bulletin. And I want you to especially take note of the little insert that Pastor Lauren provided for us in the bulletin. Uh, read it carefully. It is about the need for preschool teachers in the children's ministry. School year has started, and what that means for both children and youth ministry is that our groups get larger, uh, especially on Sundays and Wednesday nights, and as the kids come back and they get more in that regular schedule of coming and taking advantage of what we have here at Faith Memorial, we need assistance. And uh, I've been blessed with, with good help over the summer for the teens. I always need more myself. We're even looking for a couple of van drivers to pick up our teens on, on Wednesday night. And that, that is a big need that we have. But Pastor Lauren especially is needing some more help with the preschoolers, both at the Sunday school hour then, and also at the worship hour. So I know with a church this large, you look around and you think, well, surely the person beside me or surely there's somebody else doing something that maybe I could do. And the fact is, when everybody thinks that, we have nobody helping. So pray about that. And I'm sure you recall some of the ones that I remember the most growing up, the most impactful, um, influential people of the Lord that I remember as a, as a child were ones that probably wouldn't uh, be seen as, as the perfect children's worker. So just keep that in mind as you consider whether um, you have what it takes to work with children. A few other announcements. Look at the bulletin. There's stuff coming up for uh, Fame Group, as always. And uh, there's uh, Bible quizzing starting, which I'm very excited about. In fact, tonight's our first kind of opening meeting, uh, just for people to come and hear about what Bible quizzing is about. 
and that's at 6 o'clock uh, down in the basement Sunday school room. And Bible quizzing is a wonderful thing. We're covering the book of John this year, and it's not only an amazing amount of fun, but it also gets young people, teenagers, deeply into the Word of God. And there's no better year uh, to start than the book of John. I love the book of John. So if you're at all interested, come talk to me after the service, and I'll let you know more about Bible quizzing. Rummage cell coming up, and uh, some of you are asking, Aaron, why do, you, why do you do the rummage cell every year? And every year I ask that myself, why do I do the rummage cell? And basically, one reason. It's for the money, right? It funds a lot of what we do in the youth. And so hold on to your things, or as Pastor Jonathan would say, your, your stuff. And uh, two weeks before the rummage cell, starting September the 15th, is when we start collecting those. And the two Saturdays before the rummage cell, we, we can come out and also get your larger items. So keep that in mind. Well, I think uh, that is all that I have. But there is one more announcement. Operation Christmas Child, I believe. Um, were you going to say a few words before the video? Video, then you. OK. They're excited, overjoyed, and you can see it on their face, you can see it on their eyes. Some of them are receiving the gifts for the very first time. It's a symbol to know that God knows me and God loves me. Jesus loves you. Before handing out the boxes, we share the gospel with them. Through this shoebox, we want to tell a child that God loves you and he has created you. We've been able to touch the lives of children all over the world to give them a gift and do it in Jesus' name. Moses is making a difference by bringing this joy, but also giving them the true gift, which is Jesus. It's changing the globe. Volunteers from all walks of life and all ages love packing Operation Christmas Child Shoebox gifts. Good job. Operation Christmas Child is seriously one of the best things going on in the world right now. Operation Christmas Child is carried on the backs of volunteers. They are incredible people. They just love doing it. It's humbling to know that you're taking part in spreading the Word of God to children that you've never even met. You're showing them the love of Christ. There's going to be a lot of happiness, and I'm glad I'm a part of it. When we pray, God takes your gift, and He begins to navigate it. Your gifts are then given to children around the world, and that's only the beginning. After a child receives a shoebox, they are invited to a follow-up discipleship program. The Greatest Journey is a 12-lesson program where the child gets an opportunity to learn more about Jesus. It provides a summary of, of the gospel message in a way that a child will be able to engage and understand. Through the greatest journey, children are growing now knowing the Lord. When you give a gift and you give it in Jesus' name, God takes that and multiplies it. Every shoebox is really the beginning of the journey of evangelism and discipleship, and that leads into multiplication. From a very small thing, God is touching the world. From the shoebox to the greatest journey, this is the Great Commission. A shoebox puts a smile on the face of a kid anywhere in the world. For the rest of their lives, they remember that box. Isn't it incredible to see the impact that these simple gifts are making in the lives of children all over the world? Millions of children are being blessed, not only by the items in each box, but by your prayers. So thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. We never have enough boxes. We always need more. So please, continue to help and continue to pray. God bless you, and thank you. Don't you want to be a part of that, making all those children so happy? Um, if you looked closely at some of the items the kids were holding and wearing and everything, there were some homemade things. So if you're a knitter or crocheter or sewer, uh, we have people in the congregation who do all of that, and they're making things to put in the boxes. Um, a group will be meeting Tuesday down in the basement in the missionary room. 
at one o'clock. So if you want to be a part of that, I'm sure they also enjoy uh, just fellowshipping with one another. So even if you don't sew and you just want to come and be a part of fellowship, and that'd be good too. One of the things I really need to stress, though, is that it does cost $9 to ship each box, and we're shooting for, I'm shooting for 2000 this year, um, so that's a lot of money. Uh, you can give monthly, you can just, you know, give, when you get a, a raise, you can give, instead of drinking your coffees every week, you can, you know, give that money, however you want to do it. But $9 to ship a box around the world is really not very much money. It also pays for The Greatest Gift, which is a book that every child receives when they get their box. And it pays to train those teachers. And uh, I just have to say, when I went to the Ukraine in May and got to hand out shoe boxes, those teachers are wonderful. They're very energetic, they're engaging, they know what they're doing, they know how to lead children to Christ, and they do it very well and it works. We have one, one child every 20 seconds now coming to know the Lord through these gifts. So if you don't do it for any other reason but to see kids being saved, that's what it's all about. But also to put those smiles on their faces is great. Um, if you don't know what to buy to help us, we need tools for the older boys. So if you're a guy and know how to shop for tools, we'd appreciate it because I don't know a good wrench from a bad one. But um, we need hammers, screwdrivers, nails, screws, tape measures, you know, any of that kind of stuff um, we could use. Um, they're making the boxes bigger. I've got one on each of the tables so you can see them so we can fit a deflated soccer ball in there real easy. Soccer balls are great. The whole village will get together and play with that soccer ball. So we need soccer balls, jump ropes, scissors, and colored pencils still. Um, if you have any questions, just give me a, a ring or see me after church. I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much for everything you're doing. Thank you, Michelle. Before we pray, I just want to remind you to pray for our children and our teens that are back in school. Lancaster went back Thursday. It was the last school district in our county to go back. So we need to keep our families and our children in prayer as they start this new school year. You guys can probably only imagine what it's like in 2018 to be in school. And we want to pray that our teens and our children are lights for Christ in the halls of schools that desperately need him. Let's, let's go ahead and stand as we prepare to enter into worship. Again, thank you. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the privilege of worship. Lord, there's lots of other places that we could be this morning, but it's times like Sunday morning, the Sabbath day that reminds us of what's important. It connects us to you, to eternity, and Lord, as a reminder of what you are doing in the lives of your people. And Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we lift up to you, especially our children and teens, like we've mentioned already this morning, what they're going to be experiencing the next nine months. Lord, who knows? But Lord, we pray that you will motivate them, give them opportunities to, in their own way, share you with their friends, for them to be evidence of what has happened in their lives, even as young people. And may others come to know you through a conversation that may happen. Now, Lord, we just give this service over to you. We pray that you just do with it what only you can do. May you speak to hearts this morning. May your spirit just weave in and out of these pews. Lord, if there's someone here this morning who maybe needs to pray for forgiveness for the very first time. May this be the, the morning, Lord, that they leave knowing you as their personal Lord and Savior. And we pray your blessing upon the worship team as they come to lead us. And then, Lord, with Pastor Jonathan as he opens up the word to us in such a special way. In Christ's name, amen.
stand and lift up our hands for the joy.
is everlasting. And we want to shout it to the, to the whole world. Let's shout our praise this morning in song. Shout to the Lord. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. seated. At this time, we're going to ask the ushers to come forward in this attitude now of giving. How many are thankful to be able to give to the Lord? It's a joy to give to our Lord for all that he has done for us. Let us pray and ask a blessing on the offering. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for your grace mercy and Lord we are in awe in wonder of what you have done for us what you're currently doing in our lives today and what you will and can do for us in the future Lord we pray for a special blessing upon this offering we pray that you use it in a great way continue to bless Faith Memorial Church wonderful fellowship that has stood a long time here in this community, Lord, 
There's still more work to do, and we pray that you bless our efforts. And Father, we again pray for the blessing upon the offertory. Uh, Lord, just uh, bless the song that we're about to engage in. And Andrew, as he sings, the God of wonders, Lord, we, we just are in awe and wonder of you. And then Pastor Jonathan, as he brings the message of truth to us, anoint him from on high, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle, and glory to the Lord on high, a God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. And you are holy, holy. The Lord of heaven and earth. The Lord of heaven and earth. Early in the morning, I will celebrate the light. And when I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by mine. A God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy, the universe declares your majesty, and you are We've already had the opportunity to worship in song, to worship in giving, and now we want to take time and worship in the Word. The question is, how much time are you going to give me? I never know when you will check out, 
And my hope and prayer is that you don't check out before I do. So we're going to look today from Ephesians chapter 5, and we are focusing our attention this morning on marriage in God's eyes, marriage in God's eyes. Now, I know that in a congregation such as ours, as well as, as we are live streaming, I know that, that there are all kinds of mitigating factors these days that um, we, we face when we talk about marriage. I'm not insensitive to that, but I am not here this morning to basically try to cure every ill. What I am intent on doing is presenting the Word of God as God gives it to us to define what marriage should be. Okay? So let's just understand from the get-go, I'm not going to talk about every fracture, every schism, every division, every mess that we deal with today that has intruded upon God's plan and God's purpose of marriage. We'd be here for weeks if we did that. But what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to look at what has God designed, what has God determined that we need to take note of, appropriate by His grace, so that we can, in essence, divorce-proof our marriages. Wow, are we ever quiet. I would think, I would think that that would be at the very heart of the church of Jesus Christ to divorce-proof our marriages. So we're going to look at marriage in God's eyes. In fact, I was going to read all of Ephesians 5, but looking at the time, um, I'm going to trust you that you will look at verses 1 through 21 on your own and look at the precursors that are necessary for us to have the relationships as we ought to have. So we will break into the reading in Ephesians chapter 5 at verse 22 and read through the 33rd verse. So if you'd stand with me, please. We'll read from God's Word regarding His view, His perspective on marriage. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. We know that does not mean in a heavy-handed way. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her, so that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, that He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of His body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. Yes and amen. But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. You may be seated. Marriage is sacred to God. Let me state that again. Marriage is sacred to God. Therefore, marriage is sacred to us. Marriage is for our good. Marriage is a blessing from God to us. It pleases God and it pleases us when marriage is built upon the grace of Jesus Christ. Marriage is a human reality as well that depicts the mystical and mysterious union and the bonds that we not only have on this side of things, but that we can have as the body of Christ with Jesus Himself. Marriage is holy. Marriage is holy. Before the church was ever instituted, before greater groupings 
tribes, societies, cultures, religious gatherings, institutions, before any of that, the first societal linchpin was husbands and wives. Husbands and wives. Marriage is the basic relational unit that underpins and supports life's richest, richest and most meaningful relationships. Just let's look at some of the connection that results from God's plan of the marriage. Male and female, two becoming one. Now again, I'm not going to get into all of the bizarre world in which we live today, but suffice it to say, male and female is what God created. God help us. What dolts we are. Marriage is the basic relational unit because when male and female come together to become one, what an incredible marvel that is and mystery that is. And quite often, if the marriage union is indeed gifted by God, there is family expansion. Children are an heritage of the Lord. We just witnessed today what happens then when two come together from two different families and they have a child. You know what happens? Like it or not, enjoy it or not, and I hope it's positive versus negative, two families also become joined over the offspring of that couple. So what does God do in all of this? He further bonds. He further joins. He expands love. He provides greater opportunity. Society itself is linked inextricably to a husband and to a wife. That's why even when we enjoy the opportunity when we bring together in holy matrimony a man and a woman, one of the parts of the vows that we mention is the fact that really all of society depends upon the strength, the stability, the well-being of that couple. I cannot underestimate or overestimate that enough. I cannot in any way share with you any more critical dimension of society than that reality. When marriages repeatedly fall apart for a variety of reasons, society is experiencing the awful fallout of that every day. We run around, try to figure out how do we deal with the fragmented lives of children. We try to figure out how can we help them to have trust again when the very factors of trust are eroded and pulled from their lives. We wonder why they can't make a decision. We wonder why there have been all kinds of studies, including Stanford and various universities, that say they came to a common conclusion why students couldn't even commit to a degree because of the, of the unbelievable connection to fractured homes. Last night... Sharma and I were sitting together, and I, th I thought all of a sudden a helicopter was landing on our, our roof. That got my attention. It would you too. I mean, I could hear the rotor. I thought, we're done. That helicopter, a lifeline helicopter, landed in our parking lot. Now, in the 10 years we've been here, it might have happened before, but never seen it. But that helicopter landed, and then an ambulance pulled up, and then police cars from all different directions, and they were ready to transfer a patient in dire need onto that helicopter so that rapidly that individual in great need could be taken to one of the trauma centers in Columbus and given the adequate care that they needed in that pivotal moment. 
So Sharma and I did. We stood at the window. We watched. We watched the whole thing. We, we watched with ur- urgency. I prayed for that individual, though I don't know who it was, because of the urgency of that moment. All that could be marshaled to help that individual in trouble was evidenced before our very eyes. Thinking about where I was going this morning with this message, I thought, how often, how often as pastors we get the word about troubled marriages because we hear the rotors? Crisis mode. That's when we get the word. We don't get the word when it's, can you help us just love each other better? Can you help us, can you give us some ideas? No, it's, because the thing is, a, is, is in desperation. My prayer today is we'll avoid lifeline. That we'll avoid the moment where we're just doing radical triage. Do you get me today? Marriage is holy. Marriage only works on God's terms. Marriage is only what it can be when it's built on Christ. But the generational blessings, the marvelous connection that comes when people together unite in the bonds of love, blessed by God, knitted together, joined, merged, brought together through Christ, is a marvel and a blessing to all who witness it and behold it. And it is a blessing to our world. So I just want to say to all of us today, your marriage, if you're married today, your marriage, your marriage, your marriage affects for good or for harm, for that which is productive or that which is damaging. Your marriage directly impacts our society and our bond. Amen. Thanks, Pastor. Marriage from God's perspective and in God's eyes is sacred at least for three reasons. I just want to share those with you quickly. There are many more reasons, but I'm going to share these three reasons. Marriage is sacred because of creation. The Apostle Paul, then Jesus, whether it's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, or Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, wherever we come across the marriage emphasis, whether it's in Peter's writings, wherever it is, or other Pauline places, the fact is, as we look at the compendium of Scripture about marriage, marriage is sacred, just as the Apostle Paul was inspired to write here, is first of all sacred because God created it. God created us, male and female, for each other, for the marriage bond to be what it ought to be, and brought us together with those differing perspectives and complementary perspectives, and brought us together by His divine purpose to be the unit that blesses the world. We didn't come up with this idea, and that's one thing that is horribly wrong with us today. We believe that we are the architects of our own well-being, and we are not. And that we can just look into the mirror one day and say, I'm really not that, I'm really this, and I can be whatever I want to be. You are not given that right. God created from the very beginning male and female and said, this is my plan, this is my purpose to propagate the entire world, to be a witness to who I am, and to bless what I've created. That's what God made. Marriage is sacred because of creation. We better pay attention to God. We better listen to his voice. We better look at what he has to say. Here's just one thought, just one thought to consider, just one thought, just one thought. God actually knows what he's doing. The problems occur when people make a mess of it, when they choose selfishness, when they choose disobedience, when they choose disregard, when they say to God, you didn't know what you're doing, and I don't even believe you're in in existence, and I'm going to disregard what you've had to say about the whole thing. But I'm here to say marriage is sacred because of creation. 
marriage is also sacred because of Christ. An illustration that Jesus commonly used that we cannot miss and must not miss is this. Jesus said, if you want to have an earthly example that gives you an idea of how I relate to the church and the church relates to me, here's the illustration, humanly speaking. Marriage. Marriage. That is the model that he used that we cannot miss. We must not miss because we have as statements, like statements that we have just read from Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives, what? As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. As. As statements. Marriage is sacred because Christ says, the best human illustration I can give for you to grasp the mystery of belonging to me and the church being united to me and those beautiful relational matters being expressed is the bond of a husband and a wife. And I'm abbreviating this because Arby's is calling, so... Um, second point, marriage is sacred because of Christ. I would say this, there isn't any marriage that cannot blossom, cannot flourish, cannot prosper. There isn't any marriage that cannot be fulfilling if it is centered on Christ. Last, Marriage is sacred because of covenant. It's sacred because of creation. It's sacred because of Christ, but it's sacred because of covenant. Every wedding I have ever officiated, there are vows. I want to remind us of that. Vows. In fact, God says in His Word, if you're not going to keep your vows, don't make them. Whatever those vows might be. If you're not going to keep your vows, don't make them. Now, I just want to remind us of something. As we get older, maybe lose our hair, lose our teeth, lose whatever else, lose our keys, lose everything. Thank God something keeps us bound together than just our youthful looks and vigor. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Tell you what, I look back at the days of youth and I look back at those pictures of me on a track team or a cross country team. Now, I'll tell you what, wear as many clothes as you possibly can. Um, <laughs> it's your friend. <laughs> it's your friend. Um, all kinds of things happen as we move through life. One essential factor we cannot miss is we have been brought together by vows. And we don't kick them to the curb, and we don't treat them as if they're insignificant, and we don't cast them off without an understanding of how important they are. One of the reasons we stick together is because we made vows. Do you remember any of those vows? I know it might be a fog, but do you remember any of those vows? Honor. You're keeping things. In what kind of conditions? When all goes well, when there's no bad breath, when everybody looks good, when we've got all that we need, when we're driving our swanky vehicles. No. Richer, poorer, sickness, health. Now, I don't want you to leave here thinking things fell apart. I want, I want us to remember this. One individual cannot control the other individual. Both individuals have to be of like mind and like heart for the marriage to be what God wants it to be. If somebody else ducked out on their vows, you can't control that, and I understand that. But in an optimal sense, what God wants us to remember is in those moments where we recognize love is not just hormones and love is not just emotion, Love is choice. And if necessary, we remember, I made 
vows. Amen? It's not just, well, I don't feel like it today. We're drifting apart. Nonsense. That is a gutless world and a selfish world in which we live. You made vows to that individual before God. You made vows. And even if it gets rocky, even if it gets difficult, even if things are, are teetering at times, you made vows. Marriage is sacred because of covenant. I'm sick of our world intruding on beautiful, noble purposes of God. And I'm sick and tired of the fallout. If you want to know where I am today, I'm tired of it. Because the fallout just ripples on forever until we leave this world. And it always damages the innocent. Divorce proof your marriage. How so? Honor God. Honor God. Now, I would say this, too. Absolutely avoid the idea that somehow the grass is greener somewhere else. Don't forget, it's usually over the septic tank. The grass is not greener. Do you hear me? It's not greener. So honor God... Keep your vows, keep your promises, choose in your prayer life, help me love my spouse as Christ loves the church, or help me respect my spouse as you want me to. To please Christ and make use of His grace, we stumble, we have difficulties because we do not appropriate the grace that is sufficient for our marriages to thrive. And never blame it on God and never blame it on anything else. The only reason things fall apart is because of selfishness. Please Christ and make use of His grace. Keep the covenant. Keep the covenant. Keep the covenant. Now, I know, again, you cannot do that for the other per person. I'm talking about two keeping the covenant. I'm going to close with this. Remove trust barriers and trust breakers from your life. Remove trust barriers and trust breakers from your life. Two become one, two become one, two become one, two become one. I don't like this notion of two becoming one except they keep private, keep, keep secret, keep all of these pockets of reserve that, that the other partner doesn't know about. That is a trust barrier, that is a trust breaker. You know, it's just force of habit. But during the course of, of the day, if I know I've got to go to Columbus and make a hospital call, there are a lot of common sense reasons too, but if there are a lot of other things that I need to do, it's just force of habit for me. Not that Sharma demands it, but it's just force of habit to me. I, I call her and let her know where I'm headed, where I, where I have to go, what I'm doing, where, where I'm going. I let her know. There's a reason for that. Because I don't want there ever to be secrets from her. I don't want her to wonder where in the world I am, what in the world I'm up to. The other thing is, when we got married, my $5 and her $10 were merged into one account. We had 15 whopping dollars. Now hear me, I know you have differences, but this is now coming to us from secular psychologists. You know what they're saying? They're saying one of the greatest underminers of marriage today is the non-merging of finances. It builds mistrust. Individuals, I, I got my money, you got your money, I'm not telling you how much I have, you, can't, you don't have access to it. What in the world? That's basically building into the, the, the matrix of your marriage. I can't trust you. You can't trust me, so we're, we're going to operate this way. 
I'll tell you what, if Sharma's 10 bucks hadn't come to my five bucks, would have been in a world of hurt. We couldn't have bought much tomato juice and macaroni. We would have been in trouble. If secular psychologists say these are trust barriers, trust breakers, pay attention. Pay attention. Two become one. Two become one. Know what, know what you're doing. Make it clear where you're going. Keep good accounts. Keep the other individual informed. Decide on your purchases. Come together and recognize we're going to do this together or we're not going to do this, but we're going to decide together, 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 together. I don't have enough time to go where, where I'd like to go today in all of this. I would just beg of you one thing. Look at your marriage. Look at any of the obvious trust barriers or trust breakers and get rid of them. And come together under the grace and goodness of God and pledge together and perhaps even renew together those vows to make your marriage what God wants it to be and how God views marriage. I plead with you. I don't want to hear the rotor blades because you're, in, because you're in a disaster. doesn't mean I don't care. It doesn't mean I won't do my best. But at that point, there's often very little we can do. Dear hearts, we're not stupid. Come on. We're not stupid. Pastors are often not needed as much. I know this, you, know, you can say, I've been saying that all these years. Pastors are not needed as much as we often feign that they are. You have a Bible. You have the Word of God. You have a mind. You have a conscience. This stuff isn't some kind of Euclidean geometry. This is common sense. This is what God has said. Walk in it. If you're in trouble, pray together. Stop, confess it to one another, and say we need to pray that God can honor this marriage that we're in. And then don't step out of the bounds that God has prescribed. All right, that's it. I'm quitting. And you're all saying, Amen. Amen. Friends, the erosion of the family is our one issue that has affected our culture to its deplorable condition. Traceable to there traceable to that determine you want to have a marriage in God's eyes Father you know our lives you know our hearts you know our marriages you know our circumstances you know our situations I am praying today I'm pleading today that we will hear your voice hear the witness of your spirit saying this is the truth walk in it I'm praying Lord today that the attack on our homes and the attack on our families will be thwarted and that we will indeed put on the whole armor of God and that we will do our best soberly, seriously and accountably to insulate our homes and our marriages from the enemy's attacks. May we not be ignorant of his strategies. May we be aware of what destruction he wants to bring to us. And may his attacks not be able to penetrate what you have protected because people have sought your grace and your face. We pray it in Jesus' name.
for his sake. Amen. I think, friends, I think today, I think it's a great, it's a great song for us to conclude with, Be Thou My Vision. If Jesus is the center of your life and your home, if he is your vision, oh my, what God's grace can make possible in your home. Let's stand together and sing that, Be Thou My Vision. As we close, we have a list of tremendous needs. Carolyn Dar Derenberger, um, her brother passed away. I know Jill is here, but we're praying for Jill. Jill's had some issues of health in the last few days. The family of Jack Whitmore, Jack passed away. The family of Jaden Spires, little guy we've been praying for for quite some time, also passed away. The family of Catherine Mathias, we're remembering all these who are grieving. Ted Antes is home, but he had quite a fall, and ribs broken, collarbone broken, uh, some fractures, small fractures to vertebrae. Um, Ted has a long road ahead of him, and we want to pray for him. Betty Aerosmith, Tessie Akers, as well as unspoken requests that have been mentioned. Let's keep these in mind, and would you at least one or two of these hold in your heart and in your prayers as we close. 
Father in heaven, thank you for the truth today. Thank you for the witness of your spirit. Thank you, Father, that your word never, ever goes out of style. It never becomes irrelevant. Thank you for its pertinence to us today. Help us, Father, to take it. Help us to say the amen in our own lives. Apply it to us. May we say, make it so in us. I pray, Father, for our homes and for our families and for our marriages. And Lord, I pray that we will not be just like the world. I pray that we will show the world your grace is sufficient. The needs are many today. We lift grieving individuals to you today and folks who have traveled because of these losses. Be with them. Strengthen those who are afflicted in health. We think also of our own Pastor Mel. Strengthen Pastor Mel, what he's physically dealing with. Thank you for Jill. And Lord, thank you for Ted and Tessie. We lift, Lord, these needs to you today. Precious lives, dear to us, part of our body. They're a part of the family of God. Bless, work, heal, touch, have your way. Have your way. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in God's grace and peace. You're dismissed.